Hello, everyone. We continue um, today's lecture by also looking at um, another function, another important function of the management uh, uh, um, rules, which is leading. And um, this is the chapter nine of the book we are using. And at the end of this learning outcome, this is the various um, concepts we are expecting. You should be able to define leadership. You should be able to distinguish um, leadership and management and describe components of leadership, theories of leadership and contemporary issues and also motivation and communication. The outline of this presentation will take this form. So we will start with the first concept, which is leadership. So in a hypothetical scenario where we have talked about the fact that um, you are having a visions and the missions and how to attain the visions and the mission. That is the uh, planning and how to get uh, combine these resources and control, which we are going to talk about later. Now, in having all these um, functional rules, how do you therefore influence and guide and direct employees to achieve this? That ability to influence is basically what we are discussing today or what we are discussing now, that is leadership. So in terms of leadership, as we are saying, it is the process of influencing employees to work willingly towards the achievement of organizational objective. Now, one important thing about this definition is that we are looking for two important aspects two important aspects, that is the ability to influence. And when we talk of the ability to influence, when one is able to exert some form of uh, um, power over another, you are able to influence a person's behavior. So that is one important uh, and when you are defining the concept of leadership. So the process of influencing employers to work and not just about influencing. Another thing that we also look out for is in, the, in that interdependent relationship between the leader and his followers, the interdependent relationship between the leaders and the followers. So you should be able to influence, that is what we are saying. And there should be also some form of interdependency because you both need each other to survive. Without uh, followers, there is no leader. And without a leader, followers cannot be able to get to the destination as or, or somebody to guide them as to where to get there. So leadership is an important um, aspect and it's also one of the most researched topics as far as management and, and concepts are concerned. We are now going to look at the concept between leadership and management. Now, it is not all managers that are leaders. You can be a manager without being a leader, and we can be a leader without being a manager. However, for organization to grow, then there should be some form of integration. There should be some form of um, a direction where managers and can um, be able to find people who are both managers and also have the same trait of leadership skills. Because as we said, it is not just about the process of um, being in position, but if you're in position, there should be some form of our ability to influence others' behavior. And when we are able to connect this to where the aim of having um, good managers who are also good leaders, if we're able to integrate these two concepts, then which means that the company or your business is in this uh, modern time is made to flourish. So influences, influencing people's behavior is an, an important thing because if you want to influence people's behavior, then the, the, the relationship between the leader and the follower should be on a good term. And it's not just being about a manager. You should be able to have that ability to influence people. And one thing that distinguishes managers from leadership is that when you talk of in terms of management as a concept, management is a broader concept, like what we are discussing um, in the general function. The general functions of management comprises of both the planning, the organizing, controlling, and leadership. So leadership is just one aspect of um, management. When we talk of management and we talk of the concept of managers, who are people who are put in position or holding, some people will have the position, but in terms of whether people listen, people are able to adhere to their directions. That is what we are saying, that that manager should have the ability to influence. That influential role is what this concept is discussing, the concept of leadership. In integrating managers and leadership, as we are saying that 
our aim is to have um, good managers who are also good leaders, then we should be able to understand components of leadership. What are these components of leadership? The component of leadership is that managers will have the right to use the authority, will have power, will have certain responsibility, will be able to delegate and will be able to account to influence employees to achieve organizational goals. So as a manager, once you are able to possess this component of leadership, that it means that then it's a good thing for an organization to progress. Now, let's take this component and this few components and see how it can briefly, we are later going to take them individually and going to talk about them. So what is authority? Authority basically denotes the right of a leader to give commands and demand actions from subordinates. So here we are talking about the rights that is basically given to uh, um, uh, um, uh, um, um, a leader. So it is basically a law for it is backed by law. So in terms of if you are a, 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 a CEO, there are certain rights that we are demanding from you and that you will be able to give certain um, directions. You can be able to give certain uh, um, uh, um, uh, directions or certain demand that you subordinate A, subordinate B, you do this, you do that. You can, he has the right to maybe transfer one person from one department to the other. That ability, that right given to a leader is what we are calling authority. We should be able to distinguish it from power. Now power is the ability manager's ability to influence the behavior of others. So power is not just about um, uh, um, the right, but that one here, we are talking about the ability, your ability to influence employees' behavior. You may not necessarily have um, be in um, uh, um, have authority, but even sometimes you realize that sometimes in your own friends that you work with, someone has the power to just initiate something and people just adhere to. So they have that power to influence your behavior. When your friend says that, hey, let's go to the mall, you may not have the willingness to go back because your friend and that friend has that kind of influential ability on you, you realize that you tend to follow that person. That ability is what we are terming as power. Now we can also talk about responsibility and responsibility is the obligation to achieve organizational goals by performing required activity. So every position has a certain responsible, uh, responsibility. So if you are in a particular department, you're in the marketing department, what are the responsibilities in there? We expect you to be able to go and do research. We expect you to see how you can influence the market or how things are. Those are your responsibility, your obligations that are assigned to you in the business. We can also talk about delegation. Delegation is the process of assigning responsibility and authority for achieving organizational goals. So when you talk of delegation, here we are referring to giving employees new tasks. So employee that is already there, maybe you relinquish some of your power, you give them a new task to undertake certain uh, a, a new uh, um, job so that once such uh, uh, um, power has been released to a uh, subordinate to do a new, uh, perform a new job, that is what we are describing as a, a delegation. Responsibility is the person knows he has to do A, B, C, D. So now when a manager tends to uh, uh, relinquish a certain new directive to the um, uh, employee to undertake, then it means that he is delegating some of his responsibility to this uh, uh, um, um, individual. We can also talk about an, um, accountability. And one component, this is an important component of leadership, that whatever that we do, we should be able to evaluate our um, responsibility. So evaluating how well individuals meet their responsibility. So if you evaluate, you give accountable of your action, you give accountability of your actions, then it tells us that whether you are in the right track or you are not in the right track. So accountability is an important component we cannot ignore. So we continue our discussion. Now we look at authority. So we've already discussed what authority is and we are saying that the rights um, to perform or to influence certain actions. Now without authority, we realize that most of the processes will be halted because people do not want to respect or would not want to 
do what they are supposed to. So managers are being given authority in order to be able to influence or demand certain actions, things to be done. Hey, you uh, uh, um, this do this. And once you do give that person that uh, um, action, that means that the right to demand the person to undertake certain actions, that is what we are terming as authority. So you are able to uh, and perform certain actions. You have the right to perform certain actions to decide who does what, to demand the completion of tasks, to decide who failed to do what and organization expects of them. So the right to demand action from employees and the right to act. This is what we are saying that basically is about authority. Now, final authority rests in the owners or the shareholders. So, <coughs> sorry, in a business, um, the main authority basically lies in the owner or the shareholders of the business. And however, they can be able to transfer these authorities or delegate it to um, top managers. Top managers will also delegate it to middle managers. Middle managers will also delegate it to the other um, levels of managers. So it gets to the lowest level for the uh, um, authority to be executed or for them to employees to enable execution of their taxes for companies to realize its goal. So that is important thing or what we are talking about on authority. Another component of the leading function, which is power, we've already talked about what power is the manager's ability to influence the behavior of employees. And however, one important thing is that power goes hand in hand with leading. With that power, you will not be able to influence people to do what they are supposed to do. So power is an important thing. And when we talk of power, we can have two types of power. We can have what we call the position power and the personal power. So the position power basically is the power that is associated with the positions an individual is holding. For example, top managers, the power that is given to top management which they can also delegate to. These are what we call position power. So their particular position has its own power. And we have the personal power. The personal power, basically, it is installed on the person by the followers. So maybe the followers see a reverence in terms of, or oh, this person has the skills, has the knowledge, or um, has this uh, uh, um, ability and is able to influence them in a positive manner or is able to influence them to attain certain level. So when the followers bestow it on other, on them, we call this a personal power. Now, in talk of the power continuum in the figure 9.2 that we see, so our idea is to bring these different um, sources of power on a, or from the continuum, um, from both the position power and the personal power so that we can have I mean, some form of cohesion, uh, some form of um, um, equilibrium or some form of emergence so that if you have that position power and you also have that uh, personal power, you become a very important leader. You become a very, very important leader. So what are some of these um, power continuum? We can talk about cohesive power. We can talk about reward power. We can talk about legitimate power. We can talk about referent power. We can talk about the expert power. So what is cohesive power? Here, the power to enforce compliance through fear without um, whether um, psychological, emotional, or physical. Today, most companies can you cannot uh, enforce or uh, coerce people through physical means, but through psycholog psychological or emotional fears. The fact that you have the power to uh, um, sack people when they do not um, uh, um, uh, perform their roles when they are I mean, other man to undertake their responsibility. That power that is given to somebody of position, I mean, gives some form of um, um, emotional fear or some form of um, people to um, adhere to power. So this is what you are talking about, that power to influence people through fear. If you don't go to work, you can be sacked. Your manager can be sacked when you're asked to do this and you don't do it, you can be sacked. So that is one kind of power we are talking about. We also have what we call reward power. So here, basically, we are saying that uh, uh, um, per what you are given, we, 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 if you give, uh, um, if you're undertaking certain responsibilities, you are going to be uh, given certain rewards in the form of either salary raises, bonuses, uh, praises, award, or best employee. These are reward uh, power. So here, the ability to influence employees with a certain something of value 
to them. So maybe the best worker for pick and pay, you see your picture posted there, that is a form of reward. It motivates you to, uh, it's a form of power that influences people to attain their um, uh, 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 rules. You can also talk about the legitimate power. So legitimate power basically is the power of an organization grant to a position. So if you are a finance manager, that power that is given to you or given to you by the organization is what we are referring to as the legitimate power. It's a power that organization grants to a position. We can also talk about a reference power. So here, when uh, managers have that personal power or charisma, the personal power of charisma, when you have that ability, you realize that employees obey you at any time uh, because they tend to have you give you that respect they identify with you, associate with you, you're able to influence their behavior. That is what we are calling as their uh, um, uh, um, referent power. Leader's personal characteristics makes him or her attractive to others. Your personal characteristics is what is attracting others to you. They are able to respect you. They are able to follow you. They even influence people to, if you have that charismatic ability, you are able, you are, you, people tend to even influence you or tend to do more even when you are not there because they are believe or associate themselves with your principles and they are inspired to do more. We can also talk about expect power. So here, basically, the power that managers will have or somebody will have because of their knowledge or their expertise in a particular field. So if you have that information, if you have a certain information or you have knowledge in a particular field, you have a power. So whenever there is a need for maybe budget assessments, we need the economists to understand, help us understand. We need the finance gurus to help us understand. That ability, that power is what we are calling as the expect power, the expect power. An important, um, Note that you guys should notice that it is not power does not really rely in the manager, but the employees also have some power in 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 the business, and um, or the subordinate also have, may have certain power in the business. And one important thing is that with this four um, continuum, the coercive, the reward that we discuss, and um, the legitimate power, referent power. If a manager puts um, has all these characteristics, that manager becomes a strong leader. And with being a strong leader too, doesn't mean that um, you should ignore the power that the employees may have, because sometimes the employees too may have certain information that may be vital to the company's business and how your charismatic leadership or how your charismatic power, if you're unable to relate well with the employees to find a balance between um, the managers and the employees, you realize that there are certain things that the employees too may be withheld. In. If employees are given that kind of also to exhibit their level of power in terms of the business, their skills or the information that is previewed to them, they exert or they are able to influence, they are able to, they are motivated to work well without the manager or without even being told to do what is to be done. So even sometimes the employee may have, I mean, a, a whole lot of network, their social network may be what may even be the source of information for all, oh, how maybe the terms of research, how people are thinking about the business, or maybe an employee has a, a large followers, which may be, may be a source of market base for the business. So it is important for us to establish balance between the power of managers and that of employees. This is a very, very important concept. We continue our discussion by trying to understand some theories that have been uh, 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 put down under leadership. Then this theory, we are going to talk about the traditional theories. We are going to talk about a modern form of theories, a new type of theories that we are talk, um, going to look at. Under the traditional theories, we have basically three main types, the traits theory, the behavioral theory, and the contingency theory. Now, what are the, the perspective or what is what is being said at the trait theory. So here, because um, the abyss idea is to under, um, understand um, the, the traits, is, it involves the identification and analysis of traits of strong leaders. So they believe that strong leaders have certain um, basic traits and that distinguishes them from followers. And that is distinguishing them from their followers and from other unsuccessful leaders. 
However, this basically has not been successful in terms of the fact that we have um, different, different traits and it's difficult to um, identify or find major traits that are supposed to be common among all leaders because they are certain uh, uh, um, different, different uh, individuals with different levels of, from one another. We can also talk about the behavioral theory. So under the behavioral theory here too, the researchers are basically concerned with issues of uh, um, how leaders should behave. So we, they believe that if a leader should behave in a particular manner, it will distinguish them from unsuccessful leader. So a successful leader behave, behavior will be different from well, how unsuccessful leaders behave. So it is also um, how the delegates uh, a successful leader, they tend to look out for how a successful leader may delegate, may communicate and motivate their employees. Now under behavioral theory, there have been a lot of uh, um, universities that have tried to also explain how, or try to support the concept of behavioral theory. Uh, for example, University of Iowa. So University of Iowa, they basically in terms of the behavioral theory, looked at leadership from three basic styles, the autocratic, the democratic, and the laissez-faire. So to them, laissez-faire is the, um, the least effective. It's the least effective. That is where leader gives all the, uh, um, um, the power to the, the employees to do and do not follow up. So they give all the decision making to the employees and they don't follow up. And they believe that this is an ineffective way. Democratic is where they combined with the, they give the employees some form of ability to, con um, to also be involved in the decision making. And they believe that that is the most effective form of um, decision. If you look at the Ohio University State, they basically distinguish two types of leadership. And their leadership, they look at it in terms of the initiating structure and the consideration structure. So the initiating structure basically um, refers to the structure define um, look at the leaders um, um, definition and the structures in and the rules that the employees to attain their goals so the initiating structure basically look at the uh, who, how to define leadership and the structures and their rules and the rules of the employees to attain the goals and they also also distinguish it from what they call the consideration so consideration basically looks at the extent to which a leader has a job relationship characterized by mutual trust, respect for employees, ideas, and regards to their feelings. So Ohio University basically made these two form of distinction in terms of the initiation structure and the consideration structure. Michigan University also looked at two things in terms of under this behavioral perspective. They looked at the production oriented leaders and they looked at the employee oriented leaders. So the production oriented leaders basically focus on the tax or the technical aspect of a job, while the employee oriented basically emphasize on the interpersonal relation, interpersonal relation. Others such as um, the Black and Morton develop a managerial grid. So they develop instruments or questionnaires to assess, assess the behavior of in individuals to assess this behavior of individuals. We can continue our discussion by looking at the third um, um, theory under the um, um, traditional theories, which we call the contingency or this what we call the situational theory. So here the attempt is to determine the best leadership style for a given situation. So here they basically try tends to determine the best leadership style for a given this situation. So researchers consider variables such as how structured the task is, the quality of leadership between the leaders and the employees, the leader's position, power and the employee's role, clarity and employee's acceptance to the leader's decision. Under this contingency theory, now they basically trying to focus on the best type of leadership. Uh, um, there have been a lot of um, uh, um, leading writers to under these theories and they, how they tend to um, assess or tends to how research should take. So we have the Fred Fitless Contingency Theory of Leadership. So, so the Fred Linden's Contingency Theory of Leadership. Basically, the proposes the effective group performance depends on proper matching between a leadership leader style of interaction with employees and the degree to which 
situation gives control and influence to leader. So basically, they, what they did is um, this research does is that they develop an instrument to measure whether the leader is tax oriented or relationship um, oriented. So they try to use questionnaires to measure how effective or the performance of the interaction between the leaders. So the leaders tax, they measure the leaders tax and the relationship. And the relationship here is the relationship between the leaders and the employees. And they believe that uh, uh, individual uh, um, star, leadership star is fixed. So once you're able to assess it, you'll be able to uh, request the tax oriented leader and the leaders uh, relationship um, uh, and status. And that is basically what Fred Fiddler's contingency theory tends to look at. Other forms of um, assessing this contingency theory, also you can look at it in terms of the Robert House, Robert House, who developed the, what we call the path goal model, the path goal model. And another path goal model, basically, um, they are leaders' responsibility to help employees to achieve uh, um, their goals. So they see that it is the leader who has to give the pathway. It is the leader who has to identify. You move to this. If you want to do attain, get to um, a particular destination, the leader gives you a path for the employees to follow. And um, they, um, this uh, um, theory by Robert House, they basically try to talk about four leadership behaviors. And these four leadership behaviors in terms of the directive, the supportive, the participative, and the achievement-oriented behavior. The achievement-oriented behavior. We can also talk about Paul Hesse and Ken Blanchard. They propose what you call the situational leadership model. So the situational leadership model. And here, when you talk of this, it is premise on the on the um, it is premise on the fact that work maturity of employees determines the best leadership style of a particular situation. So to them, under the situational leadership model, is that we should look at the work maturity of the employees. So if your employees can work individually, they can be able to they need less influence on, and they need less uh, um, motivation to be influenced to attain their business. That work maturity is what determines the, the leadership, the, 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 the best style of leadership. So they also use for um, leadership style that is telling, the selling, the participation and delegating to match employees maturity in a given situation to determine the best leadership style. Moving beyond the traditional theories, it's now for us to also look at the contemporary approach to leadership. And under contemporary approach to leadership, one important thing that um, contemporary leadership tries to look out for is basically trust. It's basically trust. So trust is the key to leadership, success, an essential component of successful working relationship. So a leader that is considered trustworthy enables cooperation encourages information sharing and increases openness and mutual acceptance. So basically a leader that is having all this uh, uh, um, uh, 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 consideration and or trust, it seems to understand as, an, as a, a leader who has more and more trust and has the ability to influence people's behavior. So what this contemporary leadership tends to look out for is that when you consider the trustworthiness of an, a leader, it motivates its followers to or inspires them to achieve what they want to achieve. So it, it enables them to cooperate. It also gives them information sharing and increased openness and mutual acceptance. We are going to look at the dimensions of trust. I'm just trying to give um, what this contemporary um, um, approach tends to look at. So trust, is the extent to which an individual is perceived to be demonstrate ability, benevolence, and integrity. Then we can also talk about two um, elements of trustworthiness and two elements of trustworthiness under the contemporary model. We can talk about the distilled trust. That is a situation where trustworthiness of an organization of the senior or strategic leaders. And we can also talk about the proximal trust. That is the trustworthiness of a person immediate manager. So 
the contemporary um, approach basically they, they have two elements of trustworthiness that they still they still the style trust and the proximal trust now we look at the dimensions of trust now the dimensions of trust we have five main dimensions so we can talk about all of these dimensions i've tried to talk about in my opinion and um overview of the contemporary trust it is that i'm just they, they've talked about the fact that to have a trust of a leader you must possess these five i mean and um, dimensions that is integrity and integrity basically when you talk of integrity is a manager's honesty and truthfulness we can also talk about competence so competence is when the person has the technical and interpersonal knowledge and the skills we can also talk about consistency so consistency is the ability to be reliable predictable and a good judgment in handling situation mm -hmm. consistency we can also talk about loyalty so loyalty is a manager's willingness to protect another person so in terms of being a leader and having a loyalty uh, uh, um, to be influencing people, you don't just um, give people up, but you tend to protect your people. You are able to protect one another. Openness. So when we talk of openness here, a manager's reliability, reliability, when it comes to telling the whole truth, you know that this person who's open is able to tell you the whole truth, the money that was given to this person, this is the amount that was spent. This is the amount that goes into this. This is the amount that goes into this. And this kind of trust is what is needed in business managers um, ability. So we continue our discussion on um, different types of leadership. So we have um, charismatic leadership. We have visionary leadership. We have the transactional and the transformative leadership. We also have what you call the emotional intelligence and the leadership and the transformational leadership. Now, um, let's start with the charismatic leadership. So the charismatic leader basically have traits such as self-confidence, is visionary, his ability to articulate the vision, strong confession about the vision, unconventional behavior and environmental sensitivity. Sorry for the background noise. So, with charismatic leadership, we realize that um, the leaders are able to influence their followers. And basically, this is mostly found in um, politics or other kinds of um, religion because of certain ideologies that they follow. So aside the, um, the characteristics of this charismatic leadership, they have certain ideologies, and that is basically what inspires the followers. We can also talk about the visionary leadership, and visionary leadership goes beyond charisma. So basically, with visionary leaders, what they do is that they can create and articulate a realistic, credible, and attractive vision of the future of an organization. So with um, visionary leadership, we say that they can project a vision. And with that vision in the future, you realize that the company is able to follow and they be able to understand that in the near future, this is what is going to happen. And when the company follows those principles, you realize that they are able to achieve more and more success so visionary leadership basically have certain skills they are able to explain the vision to others they are also able to express the vision through the, um, their behavior and the ability to extend the vision to different leadership contests so this is some characteristics of uh, visionary leadership we can also talk about them um, um, one also thing about um, um, visionary leadership is that they are also problem um, centric leaders. That is that they are able to um, navigate their way through problems. They are able to solve problems and see problems and, and solve it. Now we can also talk about the um, third contemporary approach to leadership. That is the third um, concept. And here we have already mentioned the transactionary and the transformationary. So in terms of transactionary leaders, here, they motivate their followers by appealing to their self-interest. So when you are being asked to um, do something in exchange for a pay, maybe if you do this particular work, this is what you are going to get. If you do this, this is what you are going to get. This is a transactionary. So one is giving up his um, working skills to attain certain form of reward or certain form of pay from um, the company. So that is what we call the uh, transactionary leaders. It's, it's, Transformational leadership goes beyond that. Now with transformational leaders, 
here, basically the leaders and the followers raises one another to a higher level of morality and motivation. So whilst we are describing transactional leadership as an exchange of reward for compliance, we are saying that transformational leaders, um, leaders effects on followers because they have the followers have this and um, they feel they can trust the leader, they admire the leader, they have loyalty to the leader, and they respect their leader. So that is what basically we call transformational leadership. And this is an important aspect of uh, um, leadership because the, the, the behavior that is displayed by these transformational leaders influences or inspires its followers. The followers have their trust, they admire them, they are loyal to them, and they respect them. So we are saying that in terms of to have this transformational leadership, then there are these four um, transformational styles, idealized behavior, inspirational motivation, intellectual stimulation, and individualized um, consideration which is very, very important. And in terms of modern uh, aspect today, we need transformational leaders, leaders who have this foresight of uh, um, doing things, leaders that are effective in organization, major change. Uh, and when there's a major change, they are effective in an organization because they are able to transform. And uh, when transformations are taking place, they are able to see it and be able to adjust companies to tone in line with new development. So companies who do not, who lack um, transformational leaders are unable to compete in terms of the modern day technologies in the industrial um, um, technology, such as the um, using online business, online markets, e-commerce and things to, uh, I mean, so this is what transformational leaders do. They basically see vision, they are visionary, they promote the vision of the company and they inspire their uh, um, followers. And they are also able to not just inspire their followers, they end their trust, they, they, they end their loyalty, and they are able to adjust and navigate through problems or in the situation of changes in the global environment. One important thing we can also talk about is what you call emotional intelligence. Now, emotional intelligence is basically the ability to monitor one's own and other feelings and emotions, to discriminate among others and to use this information to guide one's thinking and actions. Others, uh, um, this emotional intelligence was basically defined by Savol, Faye and Meyer and others such as Daniel Goldman have been able to also distinguish it from what you call the emotional competence. So emotional competence is a learned capability based on emotional intelligence. So it's a learned capability based on emotional intelligence resulting in outstanding performance of work. So emotional um, um, intelligence that we are talking about basically is about self-awareness, self-management, social awareness and the relationship management. These are very, very important aspects that we also need to look at. Now we move our discussion to look at the new approaches to leadership and the new approaches to leadership. Basically, we are going to look at the ethical leadership. We are looking at the cross-cultural leadership, the managing diversity, the servants leadership, the peer-to-peer -peer leadership and the agile leadership. Now in ethical leadership, here we are seeing that effective leadership entails expectations that top managers should maintain high ethical standards for their own conduct, demonstrate ethical behaviors consistently, and hold members of the organization to the same high ethical standards. So this type of leadership is saying that as a leader or as a manager or as a top manager or as an employee, you should uphold high standards, high ethical principles, so that every person in the organization also hold or try to maintain the same ethical standards in the organization. There wouldn't be any undercutting and you go by the principles. You make sure that you are in the, um, the organization or local businesses follow uh, um, the principles, ethical principles that are needed in re-engineering or making sure that new um, uh, 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 emergence in the businesses are also not, I mean, going to um, affect uh, 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 environment, going, going to affect um, the consumer's trust or anything. So once you are able to uphold businesses to this um, ethical principles, it's a good thing for 
the country, a company. It's a good thing for the company. And leadership in these complex times requires nothing less than a whole shift of mental moves, a step in a collaborative situation with the futures and the current environment. And that doesn't mean that because you want your company to grow in the near future, doesn't mean that you forgo your ethical principles by doing certain shady jobs or certain shady attitude that will undermine the progress of your business. Another aspect of new approaches to leadership, which is also important, is the cross-cultural leadership. Now, with cross-cultural leadership here, we are saying that in a growing environment, in a growing environment, you should be able to consider the interpersonal skills, including culture, verbal and nonverbal skills, and trustworthiness. Now, when you are able to consider this cross-culture as a leader, if you're able to consider the, the different um, um, cultures, the different um, um, that you are um, facing, it is important. So cross-cultural leadership basically is different it's a different cultures and a willingness to adjust one's own behavior to accommodate others' values and norms. It's basically what we are saying here, that you should be able to consider other cultures, that they should be able to employ different, different environments. And now businesses are becoming more complex. We are having different, different uh, uh, environments, different cultures, cultures with, from different backgrounds, different leaders with different skills. And all of these are important in terms of the business environment, in terms of the business uh, and development. We can also talk about the fact that um, we should be able to manage um, the diversity. Companies are becoming more complex. Organizations are becoming more complex. So in terms of the uh, working environment, we should be able to also ensure certain that um, Demo, um, diversity, the diversity either from demographics or diversity in terms of the uh, uh, workforce. So in terms of the workforce, we know we can have full-time workers, we can have independent contractors, part-time workers, home-based teleworkers and disabled workers. All of these are important. We need to accommodate flexible workforce. We need to accommodate flexible workforce. We also need our workforce to be also um, heterogeneous heterogeneous in terms of either race, in terms of gender, in terms of ethnicity. These are important. We can also talk about servant leadership. Servant leadership, and here when we talk of servant leadership, the good or a better way for a leader to serve is for a, um, for a leader, to be a good leader is for you to serve. That is when you say to serve, you have to put others' needs on top of your needs. You put, you put um, the followers' interest above and making sure that you attain uh, um, others' needs and that uh, um, gives you that ability to influence uh, people's uh, um, behavior because they see, your followers see that you have the uh, vision at heart. And that is what we could term as the servant leadership. We term as a servant leadership. We can also talk about the peer-to-peer um, leadership. We can also talk about the peer. So the peer-to-peer -peer leadership is an effective in organization using an interconnected central network. So it's effective in organization using an interconnected network, um, central network. So either the um, node community, the equipotency community, the relational dynamics, you need to have certain interconnectedness in this organization. And this is what we are terming as the peer-to-peer uh, 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 um, form of um, leadership. So peer-to-peer -peer leadership is also a new way to provide leadership in an organization can, by using technology and the interconnectedness of a network where everyone is a sender and a receiver and a leader and a follower to attain the goals of the organization. Lastly, we can also talk about uh, um, the modern form of um, um, leadership. We are talking about the agile leadership. So the agile leadership is the ability of a leader to be able to lead in a wide range of circumstances in the new, changing, and ambiguous situation. So agile leaders are leaders that we need in terms of um, uncertainty. So what happens is that such leaders basically, they whenever there is an uncertainty outcome, they use an uncertainty outcome to find opportunity. They tend to be obsessive 
learners and talented non-innovators. So they are able to develop new um, pathway whenever there's an uncertain situation. They are able to navigate a company through uncertainty so that the company will, will be able to change or be able to adjust to rapid change. And this is what agile leadership are. So agile leadership leaders are willing to learn and they are humble. They gather input from both inside and outside boundaries of the organization. They trust those who use um, better those they trust um, and those who knows better than they do and they learn they're willing to learn new information they are willing to learn new information so being a visionary leader in the context of an agile leadership means creating and compelling genuine visions and sharing it extensively in an organization extensively in an organization so this is basically what the agile leadership is all about we continue our discussion by looking at the concept of motivation. So motivation is also an important aspect in terms of leadership and motivation here, mostly it is an inner desire that needs to be satisfied. So it's this motivation process. And in the motivation process, we must understand the desires or the things that people basically look out for. And once you understand the things that people are looking out for, if you're a manager, you must understand what actually is, a, a, is, is inspiring your followers. And once you're able to do that, it helps you to work towards those things or it helps you to influence those um, ethics or those traits that basically influence your employees and that will influence the performance of the business. So the performance of a company basically is influenced by the ability, um, motivation and resources. So the ability is influenced by the the ability, motivation, and resources. So if you're a manager and you understand what motivates the behavior of employees, then you can influence behaviors work performance. That is what we are saying. So if you have to understand what motivates their behavior to do something or not to do something, then it will help you to influence, identify these things that is motivating them and help you to influence those motivating factors and help the company achieve the productivity it needs. So one important aspect too about um, a manager's rule is that they lead um, either a group or teams and the concept group of teams have been used interchangeably. It has been used interchangeably and a team is a special kind of a group and changing groups into teams is a process that requires special management skill. So though they have been used interchangeably, but we are this uh, concept, we are going to uh, distinguish um, these two. So there's a saying that while all teams are also groups, not all groups are teams. While all teams are also groups, not all groups are teams. So at this concept, you are looking at the concept of groups and later we'll look at the concept of um, teams. So a group comprises of two or more individuals who regularly interact with one another and work for a common purpose. So it basically interact with one another and work for a purpose. We can talk about informal groups. So informal groups here, we can talk about two types of groups, either interest group, that is group members who share common interests. So group members who share a common interest, that is an informal, they basically are coming together because they have certain uh, um, characteristics together. It can be either the workplace or basically because they, um, they are um, providing with a better facility. So this group can be disbanded when in the organization with better facility, this group can be disbanded. So interest group basically groups with common interests coming together. Um, a group of employees might campaign for a better criteria facility at their workplace. So they have common interests. They want certain things, something to be done. That is why they are forming a group. This another form of that, they can also be a group that can come from maybe true friendship. So friendship groups usually exist to satisfy the social need of their members. So if you want to talk, give an example, a group of employees might play bridge once a week. So friendship group, they will meet uh, particularly in a particular Friday weekend, and they may be student group or something because they are friends, they meet and they have their enjoyment or share certain um, social needs um, together as members. We can also continue by looking at um, formal groups. 
You can also look at formal groups. So formal groups here, we have the command groups and the task groups. So command groups appear on the um, um, organizational charts. The command formal groups are categorized as either command groups or task groups. So command groups appear on the organizational charts, basically indicating the line of authority. So in the command group, in the line of authority from managers to the employees. So from each level, we have certain groups and the organizational structure defines formal groups in terms of allocated works, assignment, and the de determined tax. So, and the formation of work groups. So this is what a formal groups does. Now, in terms of organizational um, task group, we are here, we are saying that we form this group just to perform a particular tax. So maybe you want um, there to be um, something to be done in a company this task group can come from different uh, uh, um, grouping levels. So we can, we can have somebody from a management level, somebody from the finance level, somebody from, and this forms this group, they are just there to undertake certain development in their particular, uh, um, 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 particular performance, particular tax. When that tax is done, you can disband that group or uh, um, and let our group stay to perform another tax in the near future. So that is what we are seeing under the formal group. There are certain characteristics we are also going to look at in our next discussion. So the characteristics of groups. The characteristics of group is that every group is different in terms of structure and a characteristics. So what are the main uh, characteristics in terms of, we can talk about the group size, or group size to when you have a large group size, it's difficult to undertake certain um, decision making. So you can have the group size. We can also talk about the group composition and the group composition to we are saying that there should be differences and um, like the component, what is made up of the group should be different in terms of um, heterogeneity, in terms of gender, race, nationality, or in terms of uh, 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 um, um, performance from homogeneous group over time. So a particular group in terms of composition can have different race and um, 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 nationality or um, um, uh, gender. Gender. We can also talk about um, group norms. So the group norms here basically these are the standards that are shared by the members that develop from interaction between these uh, members. So the norms can be having can be positive or negative, and managers should manage them. So an example of a positive norm is that a group strives to outperform other groups. So a group has its own norms. Now with this kind of group, they share certain uh, um, um, standards and their standard is that, oh, as a group, we want to perform better than the other group. So a group of um, assignment A would want to perform than another group. And that is the, the norms, their norm, that's a positive norm. When that groups do not um, tend to perform better, then it becomes a negative norm. We also have uh, something that binds groups together. That's what we call the groups um, cohesiveness. So there's a strong relationship between um, um, performance norms and cohesiveness of uh, um, a group. So the things that actually pull the group together is what we are calling as the group cohesiveness. The adherence to group norms will be stronger. When that thing is there, it, 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 it adherence to the group norms will be um, stronger. We can also talk about the status in groups and the status in groups can be either formal or informal, meaning that sometimes groups give um, um, formal or informal status to group members who are relatively on a low of the hierarchical level. So status drives from factors such as age or experience. So that is the status of, of a group in terms of social influence, you can look at it in terms of the age experience or the social influence of a group member. And that gives the group a status in uh, um, uh, in a group, their status in a group. We can also look at um, the formal leadership. And here we are usually concerned about titles such as the section or the department or um, department manager, supervisor, project leader, or committee chair. So sometimes, an informal leader has more influence in a group, which may influence the performance of the group positively or negatively. So formal leader, we are saying that a formal leader can be a project leader, committee chair, or may have certain uh, a, a, a position, or maybe the supervisor. An informal leader too may not be 
uh, having that position or influence, but may be very, very vital in terms of influencing groups. So these are the characteristics of groups we are talking about. We continue our discussion by looking at or understanding the concept of teams. So as we said, a group is a unit of two or more people who interact primarily to share information and make decisions that will help each other or each group member perform within their own level of responsibility. Work teams basically goes beyond. So work teams comprises of a small number of employees with complementary competency who work together on a project. They are committed to a common purpose and are accountable for performing tasks that contribute to achieving the organizational goals. So when you say that work teams, it is not just about um, putting two or three people uh, um, to share information, but work team basically are going to undertake a particular project. And that particular project, each and every individual has a role to play. So if the, um, the, um, the ending performance is not well, then we are saying that then the whole team have perform poorly. So each and everybody has a, a performing task and they contribute to the organization. So you need this individual to do this, you need this person to do this, to do need this person to do this to achieve a project. So let's take, for example, if you want to add, um, organize um, an award scheme, we need maybe somebody from the finance department to tell us the budget that we need in terms of what we are going to do. We also need um, somebody from uh, um, ad advertisement to tell us how we are going to advert advertise um, um, to make sure that we get the needed uh, people to attend that um, um, award project. So you need, everybody has its role. So if one person decides not to perform, it affects the whole team. And when that uh, 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 situation happens, then the whole team is seen to be having a bad uh, um, light. You don't, uh, when the, the, the group does well, it comes for the whole group, when one, um, when um, when the whole team performs well, it comes from the whole team. When the whole um, team, uh, one person performs poorly, which affects the whole team too, it's still um, hanging on the whole team. So we see the team as an uh, as a as an uh, collective than as an individual entity. As a collective than as an individual entity, there are different types of teams. We have the problem solving teams. We also have them self managed work teams. We have the cross functional teams. So the self solving teams basically comprises of employees from the same department. Basically, they meet regular to discuss ways to improve quality, efficiency, and the work environment. So they are problem solving. They basically meet to think and they think about how to improve the quality, the efficiency, and the work environment. For the self-managed work teams, basically they take on responsibility from their former managers, including tasks such as planning, scheduling, and control. So the self-managed work teams, they take on um, responsibility from their managers and their responsibility include their planning, scheduling, and control. So team members address problems in the workplaces. This team at members, they addresses problems in the workplace. Sometimes even if sometimes even the selection of team members and the and this and discipline. So the self-managed team workers basically and the workplace, they go beyond the controlling, scheduling and control, and also maybe also be involved in the selection of team members and the dis discipline that occurs at the workplace. We can also talk about the cross-functional teams. So cross-functional team basically comprises of the same hierarchical level but from different work areas. So here, what we are saying is that who, members who come together to accomplish a tax, they are from different um, hierarchical um, um, le work levels, and they basically come together to perform these tasks. So it is important that organizational performance reward system encourage team effort. So high performance team effort has several characteristics in common. There's a clear understanding of the team goals, members who can adjust their skills, high mutual trust among members, good communication and adequate negotiating skills. Team leaders who encourage team members by clarifying goals and who help members to realize their potential. Realize their potential. Another aspect of effective um, leadership is the communication. Communication is an essential element in leading. Effective leaders depends on constant communication between leaders and their employees. 
So it is important for there to be a very good uh, flow of communication. That when communication starts from the sender, it will, it should make sure that the message is clear, the channel through which it passes through, and it should also ensure that it goes to the level and uh, to the, the receiving end. The person who is supposed to take this information has received it. So in, communication is an important aspect of leadership. And the flow of communication to face-to-face -face communication where possible, or if you are sending a message to a particular end person, you must make sure that the message is clear. You must make sure that the, the channel through which you are passing through and the receiver on the audience to understand the message and it's being received. So for you to be effective leader, then there should be a, you have a good communication strategy. So what we have discussed in this section so far is, is that we have talked about um, how good leaders, the theories of good leaders and the characteristics, the traits, theories. We've also talked about um, understanding motivation, what motivates employees. And we are saying that if a leader should understand things that motivate employees, then they can be able to influence. So leadership talks about the influencing nature. And another important thing that we've also finally talked about is communication and communication is key. Leader must know how to communicate so that you be a leader and become a boss. On that note, thank you for today. We'll gather in our lecture room and we'll discuss uh, further.